So I'll tell you guys at the beginning here, there are two addiction neuroscience principles that I'm trying to get across to you guys today. Please stick around till the end so that you can understand both of these principles and see how they relate to DMX's life. And then also just more generally hear what DMX has to say at the end about drugs. It's a super powerful message. What's going on YouTube? It's Ashcon, AKA Dropped Out Beats here, back again with another Addiction Neuroscientist Reacts video. Today we're gonna be reacting to not only one of hip hop's greatest artists, but music's greatest artists in DMX. I say that because in hip hop, we tend to limit our greatness to the hip hop genre because hip hop tends to only respect hip hop, but we gotta widen the genre of respect, you know what I'm saying? Because hip hop deserves to be respected by everybody. It's one of the greatest genres of music ever created, you know what I'm saying? And that means that DMX needs to get his flowers. The late, great DMX, rest in peace to DMX. He was a great musical artist, one of the greatest, like I just said. And so today, we're going to be reacting to him talking about him getting tricked into smoking crack at the age of 14 by his rap mentor. This was on the Talib Kweli People's Party podcast. Shout out to Tal Talib Kweli. Am I going to be able to talk, y'all? Shout out to Talib Kweli for the good interview. This was definitely a tough one. And so with that being said, let me throw my headphones on. Take my big ugly head off the screen you know what i'm talking about let's put dmx's beautiful face on the screen and hear what he has to say they're going to get straight into it uh, talking about um how dmx's rap mentor tricked him into smoking crack let's get into it what we're ready ron what oh, oh wow wow whoa whoa <laughs> whoa okay okay shit just got real shit just got real all right so <laughs> I'm in Yonkers, you mean, and um, you know, I just come home from being in these institutions from the age of seven to 14, you mean, and um, this guy, uh, Reddy Ron, you mean, he was like an older brother to me, and he would rap, and I would do the beatbox. And um, I looked up to him like 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 an older brother, you know what I'm saying? I like, like I love this guy like an older brother, you know, and I have any brothers. And um man, I would be boxing, he would rap, and then he, he suggested one time, he said, you know what? Um, why don't you, you know, write a couple of rhymes and that way I can do the beatbox for you. You know what I'm saying? We can like trade places. I was like, okay, like, I, I, that makes sense. And um I remember um I, I, just, I, I remember went upstairs, taking a piss, <laughs> taking a piss and that's where it's, my first rhyme came to me. You know what I'm saying? And um, referring to incidents occurring in past times when the beats of my profession, I had no rhymes with the daytime change. And so do I will. That's when I'm in my journey up the MC Hill to make my first step forward to leave behind my past. Had to put my future first, everything else last. First rhyme was unacceptable, but that's what changed by taking parts of words, but then rearranging. It was like a story. You know what I'm saying? That's what One of the greatest ever. I mean, just in the interview, you know what I'm saying? One of the greatest. Mm. Back then. And, um,. Man, this guy, this guy, oh, this guy. And, um, you know, I could tell by his response that it was like, it was a dope rhyme. I'm like, okay. You know, so we work at it like that. But this guy, man, this guy, this guy, this guy, hmm. this guy, he, he, he introduced me to what would be the best part of my life, which would be the rap. But he also, at the end of my life, is blessed with the curse. And the curse aspect of it was, um, like I said, I was, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't smoke cigarettes, I didn't smoke weed, I didn't, I didn't do, I didn't do anything. I mean, I'm 14 years old, and um, me and my man went to a robbery one night, and it was his birthday, and we came back, we we spent the money. I said, hey, you know, take this, go get some, nice for your birthday, whatever. Hmm. So he came back with a blunt rolled up, and as I'm counting the money, he likes the blunt. And I said, I, I was impressed. Oh, I don't really smoke, nigga. Fuck out of here. And he passed the ball around, and um, wow. Hmm. Hmm. It, it, and I hit the blood, and I'm like, 
like I was no longer focused on the money. It, it, it I never felt like this. Like it, it just fucked me up. I'm like, the fuck. And, um, I later found out that he uh, he laced the blood with with, with the crack. Hmm. Yeah. So we're gonna pause there because, as you can tell, it's a super emotional moment for DMX. Um, kind of a traumatic moment, recalling this uh, first time smoking both weed and crack it sounds like um i can't say that for certain but it does sound like for sure that uh it was his first time smoking crack at least because he said you know i didn't smoke weed or cigarettes uh or anything before this and and then he passed me the blunt and it had crack in it i later, I later found out and so the first principle that we need to get across here in this video is that the younger someone engages in drug use, the more likely they are to be addicted to that drug. So when I was in grad school, one of my favorite slides to present was this one that I'm about to show y'all that basically talks about how the younger someone uses a drug the more likely they are to develop a drug addiction. In this case, we're going to be looking at alcohol use disorder. So let me uh, blow this graph up here for you guys so we can take a closer look at it. Uh, on the y-axis here going up and down, we have the cumulative probability of alcohol abuse. And then on the x-axis going left to right here, we have the time since first alcohol use, meaning how long has it been since they first started drinking we also have the different ages of onset meaning at what age did they start drinking being less than 11 years old 11 to 12 13 to 14 15 to 16 17 to 18 and then greater to greater than 19 uh, years old we also have the average which is this black line right here um and so, according to this study, the cumulative probability of alcohol abuse from all of these uh, participants, or not, yeah, participants in their study was about 8%. Pretty low, um, relatively low, I should say. But when we start breaking it down by age, we can see that there's a significant difference between those individuals who started drinking at a younger age versus those individuals who started drinking at a later age. Specifically, if we look at the green, light blue, and purple lines, we can see that the likelihood that someone under the age of 14 uh, develops an alcohol use disorder is three to five times as great as someone who starts drinking over the age of 19. So, that's one of our, that's our first principle of drug addiction neuroscience today, that the younger someone uses a drug, the more likely they are to be addicted to that drug. I know I'm looking at alcohol here, but this applies for every drug, whether it be alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, doesn't matter. The earlier someone uses that drug in the, their life, the more likely they are to be addicted to that drug, not to mention the trauma that someone might be experiencing of someone who has access to those drugs at that time, right? Like someone who's uh, under the age of 14 and has access to alcohol is going to be in a less or a more lenient parental environment, if you see what I'm getting at, than someone um, who doesn't have access to alcohol, or at least I would assume so. I mean, think about what DMX was just talking about. He was just talking about how him and his friend got back from a robbery at the age of 14. Um, that's not necessarily normal behavior for adolescents at 14. And so if you're engaging in that kind of behavior, you're probably more likely to experience trauma. You're probably more likely to uh, be around drugs and then use a drug and then therefore develop a drug addiction because you have... One principle being you're super young using drugs. Another principle that we're not necessarily talking about in this video is trauma, right? Trauma greatly increases the likelihood that you will develop a drug addiction. But with that being said, uh, let's get back to the video and hear 
what else DMX had to say about this experience in his life. My thing. Why would you do that to a child? Right. He was thinking like, like, like 30, you know what I'm saying? And he, and he knew how I looked up to him. Yeah. Mm. He knew how I looked up to him, you know what I'm saying? And like, why would you do that to somebody who looks up to you like this? You know what I mean? Hmm. Take your time, brother. Uh, oh. The monster was born. Hmm. I was born. I was born. I mean, and um, that's the, like, like I, I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I mean, like I said, that's the, the someone that you supposedly love. Yeah. Yeah. So he says, "Why would you do that to a kid? Basically, why would you pass a laced blunt to a kid?" And you know, I think that's something that people don't totally understand about drugs is that it can frequently be used as kind of like an initiation tool into the club, right? Like, what does everyone do when they turn 21? You go to the bar and how many people get like blackout drunk or drunk to the point that they have alcohol poisoning, which is just defined as you throwing up, right? I mean, what happens when you go to college? Everyone is just getting drunk. And so I know we're talking about crack and a blunt here. So now we're doing two drugs being cannabis and crack cocaine. But we have this social acceptance of certain drugs. And then we think, oh yeah, once you do drugs, you know, you have some hair on your chest or something. And I just don't think that's right that we can tell by DMX. Um, this wasn't necessarily a great experience for him. Uh, looking back on it in his adult life and then uh, it definitely seems to be the case that whatever his rap mentor I think his name is Ready Ron um, whatever he did to DMX was was more than uh, just be his rap mentor he definitely laid it uh, led him astray down some bad paths and it doesn't seem like DMX um, forgives him for that or maybe he does forgive him for that but you know clearly notes that this guy was not only a good influence but a bad influence too like i think he said that earlier in the video was like this man was like the best and worst thing to me that he helped me rap but he also introduced me to these drugs and it sounds like this guy was 30 years old i mean come on dude 30 years old initiating people into the club with um crack is it's not right, but um, the second principle that I wanted to get across in this video is that the route of administration actually affects the likelihood that you will develop an addiction to a drug. So for example, the diff there's a significant difference between IV injecting a drug versus snorting a drug versus swallowing a pill and taking a drug that way in terms of developing a drug addiction and that is because of what is called your peak plasma concentration so forgive me uh i don't remember who the researchers are that uh, i got this from i'll try to link all of my research down below because um this is real science y'all uh this channel is based on real science it's not based on nonsense and it's not just you know influencer nonsense it is i'm a real scientist trained scientist and i'm going to show you all graphs so let me take my big ugly head off the screen so we can look at this graph here and we can see that the peak plasma concentration of a drug is determined partially by the route of administration so in this blue line we see the intravenous route in this red dot we see the smoked although i'm not totally sure if this is accurate uh, purple dot, we see intranasal, and greenish dot, we see oral. I'll note that this is for cocaine. I specifically found this for cocaine so that we could, you know, try to relate it more back to DMX because I was talking about alcohol, but I want to relate this back to DMX. So this is smoked cocaine. We can see the peak plasma level concentrations here on the Y axis and then the time of the drug in their system on the X axis. So uh, as you might expect, if you directly 
inject a drug into your veins, it will cause the highest peak plasma concentration because plasma is a part of your blood. And so the drug becomes diluted into your blood. And if you d inject straight into your blood, that's gonna cause the highest peak level in your plasma, right? I'm pretty sure smoked should be up here, but maybe for cocaine, it's a little different. I know uh, cocaine maybe isn't the best drug to smoke, free base, whatever you wanna call it. So maybe the plasma levels were lower for this particular study, but I think uh, smoked should be up here higher with intravenous. And, um, drug injection because as we can see the time to absorption so that this difference between where the line peaks and where the y-axis is that would be the absorption rate so we can see very fast absorption rate for intravenous and smoked drugs but much slower for intranasal and oral and so therefore drugs that are intravenously injected or smoked are going to be more addictive than those that are taken orally or intramuscularly or snorted. With that being said, let's get back into the video. I'm gonna skip ahead here um, just to let DMX kind of close us out here uh, for his opinion on drugs and drug addiction. Um, I think it's best for him to close, kind of give us some closing words in his own, own words. Hey brother, that's one of, that's actually, the biggest problem, not addiction. Mm. Uh, and I always said this, I mean, drugs were never a problem. Drugs were a symptom of a biggest problem, mm. a bigger mm. problem. Mm. And, um, you know, um, there was things that I went through in my childhood and where I just blocked it out, blocked it out, blocked it out. But it, there's only so much you can block out, you know, before you run out of space. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you never know when you know, the things you stored away are just gonna come out and just fall all over the place. And you know, you know, it, it might not, it, it probably won't be a pretty situation. So I learned that I had to deal with the things that hurt me that I didn't deal with when they hurt and mm. when they happened. I didn't deal with them then. I mean, it's like, you know what, let me, let me open this door and start dealing with this shit now before it comes yeah. at the wrong time and I just have a meltdown and you know, I, I, I'll be, you know, no more good to anybody. Mm. So. Yeah, so kind of wanted to just end it there, let DMX close it out. Drugs are not the problem. His life was the problem. And so um, I can't, you know, say this is exactly what he's saying, but um, I think what he's getting at is there was a lot of trauma that led to behavior that he, you know, led to, led to a lot of behavior that got him in trouble, got him... Um, into a lot of situations that cause more trouble, right? Like trouble begets trouble kind of thing. Um, and the drugs just made it worse in the sense that he never had an outlet to start getting this trauma off of his chest, this emotional weight off of his chest. He was using drugs to try to cope with his trauma, which never works. And that you know, led to his downfall basically. And so that being said, rest in peace to DMX. Um, he's greatly missed in the community, man. I don't even know what else to say because such a powerful figure and that, that ending, this whole interview was just so powerful. Yeah. Shout out to DMX. Please subscribe to the channel. If you liked this video, hit the like, hit the dislike. Tell me I'm an idiot in the comments below. I can tell you that I'm not because I did this. I did this for a living. You know what I'm talking about. So yeah, hope you liked the video. Subscribe to the channel. I appreciate all you beautiful peoples. It's Ashcon, aka Dropped Out Beats here. Peace out.